Hello everyone, it's Bob Browner with uh, Community Coronavirus Update number 65. We'll talk about uh, wishful thinking versus pandemic math and uh, a little bit about getting out again. Uh, so one thing I want to talk about is that I had a number of people forwarding this article from Wall Street Journal. Uh, I think we have a lot of reasons for optimism, but not this much optimism. And this guy, I think his uh, article is honestly kind of dangerous. Um, so uh, basically, yes, he is a Johns Hopkins professor. Uh, however, he's not a public health or uh, infectious disease expert. Uh, his background, he's a pancreatic surgeon. How that doesn't mean he doesn't necessarily have a good uh, point here. Uh, but I would say the article's wrong for a couple reasons. The biggest one is it's a sort of a selective reading of the evidence. He's claiming 55% have been infected already, where most experts in the United States think we're around 25 to 35%. So he's being a little over optimistic about who's already been infected, potentially immune. He also ignores the examples of Sweden and Man Manaus, Brazil, while quoting Swedes and Brazilians, unfortunately. I don't think he's been staying up to the evidence on these things. Uh, so example for Sweden, uh, you know, Sweden's sort of been the sort of the darling of the going for herd letter rip crowd uh, for, you know, most of the pandemic. Uh, initially, people thought, well, the Swedes did it right. Everything got under control. Look, they've got herd immunity because they did it right, right? Uh, no. Then they hit uh, the new uh, variants. Things went crazy over the holidays. Uh, they got so high, just like us, that they actually had to do a lockdown. They, they filled up every be uh, ICU bed in Sweden. They had to send some of their kids home from high school. Uh, then, oh, okay, now maybe we did get turned into now. No, uh-uh. Sweden's heading back up again. So uh, I'd be a little cautious about over-interpreting the Swedish approach and the Swedish data. Uh, the other thing about Manaus, Brazil, is that uh, some people thought Manaus had sort of con quote, gone for natural herd humidity. Uh, there were some antibody studies saying uh, upwards of 75% may have been infected and that they were in the clear. Uh, unfortunately, that is not what happened there either. Uh, and so this article in British Medical Journal uh, basically talking about, you know, that they thought, you know, they were having 80 deaths a day, thought they were past it. Oh, now lately, now they're up to 100 deaths a day again. Uh, they had another really, really bad outbreak break. And so once again, the, the, the going for natural herd was wrong. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, the basic misplaced confidence and, uh, and this is the problem. So read the article if you want to do the full, uh, uh, there's also a Lancet uh, that actually goes into the pandemic math, which we'll discuss shortly. They talk about what it really does take to get herd humidity uh, and the problems of the new variants. And so essentially Manaus, Brazil, they had a, you know, a huge outbreak back in the spring. They thought they were doing well uh, because they put these measures in place. But then uh, they actually had a little election madness as well, uh, opened up all their entertainment venues, got the P1 variant uh, down there, and they had a second lockdown because things uh, overwhelmed their hospitals again and people were literally dying from lack of oxygen in Manaus. And so you have to be careful and understand the pandemic math. Uh, the other problem, of course, is that every new infection is another roll of the dice. So you don't want to let it run and go for natural herd because, frankly, you can't go for natural herd. It doesn't work. Uh, and that, so this pretty much, I think, proves it. Um, so pandemic math, uh, you have to understand the math. And most, uh, most people think the r naught of the m more prevalent variant is somewhere in the 2.5 to 3.5 range. In that article, they used 3 as the example. However, the new, new infectious variants may be as high as 4.5. I used 12 as an example. That's measles. Uh, we are not that infectious, unfortunately. So if you have a vaccine efficacy at 95%, that means herd immunity is in this range and the vaccination rate needed is in this range. Uh, if you have a little bit, little bit less effective vaccine, it could mean a higher vaccination rate needed. Uh, but that's why most people are kind of quoting the 70-80% needs to be vaccinated if we want this to stop uh, because you can't get herd immunity just by natural herd alone. That's never been achieved in reality. It's only been achieved with vaccination in the past. Um, a better article is this New York Times article because herd immunity isn't as simple as the, the Wall Street Journal doc says it is. And you need to understand the variations because part of whether you get to herd or not depends on other things uh, that we can't necessarily control or predict. So anybody who says we're going to be a herd, herd immunity by a certain date, uh, doesn't is that should tell you they're wrong because we don't know for sure. It's going to depend on other things. And so what this article does, it gives you some scenarios so it's interactive. You can click through what the various scenarios are. At our current pace, uh, if a combination, and they assume 35% have already been infected, then that will achieve at least some immunity, temporary, potentially, but at least some. Then we start adding vaccine immunity to that, that we could hit a threshold at current rates of somewhere between July and November. Uh, so it's optimistic we can at least get there. I would like it better. Uh, and that we might do it better. We may have an increase in our vaccine supply. So uh, they use a scenario of huge supply and increase. Uh, so if we got up got to 5 million shots a day, I don't think that'll happen. We could be there by April, May. I don't think that's, that's a little overly optimistic. Um, but I think the middle case, 
the three million shots a day. That's just possible. Uh, we have the uh, uh, Johnson and Johnson uh, vaccine meeting uh, in a couple of days. If that gets released and we get a hundred million Johnson and Johnson vaccine doses coming out, uh, we could hit this three million shots a day, and we could be looking at herd immunity to mind bay in July and really returning closer to a semblance of normal. That is possible, and so there is reason for optimism, but we have to get it right. The other thing is this assumes two other things. It assumes, one, we don't drop our, our mitigation measures too fast and that we don't get the variants. So what does that look like? Well, if we just say end all precautions now, sound the all clear like the Wall Street Journal guy wants us to do, uh, yeah, we could get to herd maybe in May, this, quote, natural hard way, uh, but look up here, 320,000 more dead people. So yeah, there's a chance it might work, but only it would kill at least a 300,000 more 300,000 more Americans, and that presumes we don't get a new infectious variant. What if we got a new infectious variant on top of all that? Well, if we end precautions and we get a new infectious variant, uh, yeah, we could get to herd by April the natural way, which may or may not even work, and kill off another half a million Americans to get there. We do not want to gamble and go for that. We've already killed off 500,000 Americans. Let's not go for another 500,000. Uh, the real way is to, is to be a little more cautious, follow the, the pandemic math. Uh, let's hope that we get this increase in vaccine supply coming with the Johnson Johnson vaccine, keep our mitigation measures in place. And we could be close to normal in May, May June range, or a May, June, July range, but we have to do it the right way. Now, don't sound all the clear and just let it rip again. Uh, so we're in the race against time, like I talked about previously. We've got dropping COVID cases, which is great. That'll suppress any more mutations. We've got an improving vaccine rollout, and we've got more people wearing masks, and we've got to keep this up. We do not want to relax too fast and have this uh, uh, take off and kill off another half a million Americans. So uh, across the United States, think are, things are looking better. Uh, you know, we used to be a sea of red. We even have now some yellow states, Oregon, Maine, and Hawaii, Puerto Rico. Uh, we're getting better. Let's keep that going. Let's not relax too soon. Uh, here in Nebraska, kind of the same thing. We let it get out of control November, December, got it mostly under control. And this is a blip due to some delayed data. So this, this, these should have actually been back here. But it looks like we're kind of getting on that same trajectory. Hopefully we'll get down to the yellow range in the next couple of weeks. Uh, fingers crossed. Uh, our vaccine rollout is also improving. So we started out really well, then fell flat on our faces and we're one of the bottom. Uh, now we're about middle of the pack now. So, uh, so our vaccine rollout is starting to prove here in Nebraska. Um, you know, our backlog is improving, even despite the bad weather, uh, we're getting a less, uh, the time, the time from uh, distribution to administration is dropping. Uh, and so that's a good sign to see that happening. Um, so that starts opening other things. So should you go out and eat at a restaurant? And so, uh, some of the physicians I know have been talking about that, uh, now that we, some of us have been vaccinated and then we've got that full six weeks on board, is it okay to go to a restaurant? Uh, well, it's a complicated decision. And I, I like, you keep saying you want to kind of use this Swiss cheese model. You never want to rely on one thing in public health. You want layers of intervention. Well, you know, I, I my wife and I have been vaccinated. We're immune. So we should be immune. Uh, is it okay to go to a restaurant? Well, we still looked at masks. So we, uh, so short story, my wife and I did decide to go to a restaurant Friday night. We went to Sebastian's table, uh, had a really nice meal, uh, but we did the mask thing. So I, we would like, when I took a glass of wine, I had my mask on. I'd, I'd take a glass of wine like this, put my mask back on. Now, when the food came to the table, then I put my mask down. Now, when I look around, not everybody's doing that. Some people have this, the, the magic six, but six feet bubble uh, mentality where they sit down, they put the mask, take the mask off and never put it back on again. I don't think we're ready for that yet. So I would wear your mask at least intermittently at the table. Uh, the Sebastian's table restaurant is a linear restaurant with a very high ceilings, which provides a lot of space, both uh, to potentially dilute any spread. So I thought that made it a little safer there too. So the combination of vaccinations, uh, some masking and what I looks to me like a fairly ventilated restaurant. My wife and I said, yeah, let's try it out. And it was a nice dinner. Uh, also, do we have an economic duty? I mean, if, if we uh, aren't, were on the first wave and got our, got our vaccines, do we have a duty to spend some of our money at that restaurant? Uh, and I think we kind of do, actually. I think we do need to support our restaurants. They've taken some of the biggest hits. Uh, also, the waiter. I mean, our waiter was a, a UNL student, and he's, you know, he's waiting tables to make money to pay college. Uh, there's a need for him, and there's, so there's a need for us to, to tip him and pay, his, pay him so he can pay his way into college. So I think there is even a little economic duty there. So uh, another question is going to come up, though, and this will be an interesting topic coming up, is do we have uh, Israel's talking about a green pass where if you've been vaccinated, 
you can get to go to restaurants. And so whether you get to go to the restaurant or not, you'll, you'll pull up your little app and you've got a pass to go in. Uh, I know this is definitely going to be some, a factor for travel. And they're already talking about that certain cruise lines, uh, some travel, they may require you either to have negative tests and or a vaccine. Uh, and so will, as an added incentive to be vaccinated, will you get a pass because you've been vaccinated and or have a negative test? This will be an interesting discussion. There's even some, you know, ethical arguments, which they talk a little bit about in this article, which are interesting. Uh, this isn't new, though. I mean, for example, um, Brazil, uh, for the last couple of years, you've had to get a yellow fever vaccine to go because of their yellow fever outbreaks. Uh, same kind of approach. So this has always always been a potential factor in international travel to get vaccinated. Uh, and so this may be an added incentive to get vaccines. Uh, also, uh, I, yeah, I could see this happening for not just travel, but other things. So, so it'll be interesting to see how this evolves. Uh, also, I, you may have heard uh, Fauci talking about how there may be some new guidance about what can, can, be done, can and can't be done if you've been vaccinated, for example. So watch that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but until then, we still need our mass mandates in place. And so, uh, again, uh, thanks to the UNNC folks by putting the statement out there. The evidence is really, really solid. And, of course, they mentioned Brazil as well in this uh, little uh, update. Uh, you know, you can see across Nebraska, again, you know, uh, Lincoln and Lancaster County had the first, first mass ordinance, ordinance, has kept it in place. We have the lowest fatality rate. Uh, the Omaha metro area has a partial mask ordinance because they can't do it at the health department level, only a municipality. So some have it, some don't. Uh, the outstate where there's no mask ordinances have a high, still has an increasing death rate. Uh, they're going to over, overtake Grand Island, Kearney, Hastings pretty soon. Uh, even though Grand Island, Hastings, Kearney, part of their uh, problem was that they had the JBS outbreak that put them far ahead of everybody. But it looks like the, the rural areas are going to outpace them in mortality, unfortunately. So we do need those mask ordinances in place. Uh, again, talk how to wear properly wear a mask. I've linked to an article in the notes section. Um, I think this was a good article. This was in Lincoln Journal Star, although I, I've linked in the in the notes section to a Chicago Tribune article because it has an interactive discussion about how to properly wear two masks. And that you don't have to wear two masks in, in all situations, but there may be situations where you want to. So, for example, if you have a high risk health condition and you're a school teacher and you've not been vaccinated yet, you may want to do that. So. They walk you through sort of the pros and cons, how to do it correctly. Uh, I think it's a good article talking about uh, some of those uh, ways. To, and usually what people are doing is they're using a disposable surgical mask with the cloth mask over the top of it, but there's some other ways to get there as well. Uh, just like uh, Dr. Ostholm has been talking about, it's a combination of filtration, fit, and time. You know, So if you're in, in a school day all lying for seven hours, that's a lot of time. Filtration alone may not be good enough, and you get better fit when you put a, a cloth mask over the, uh, the disposable surgical mask, for example. Another option, though, of course, is an N95 mask, which uh, also would be effective, and you, don't, you wouldn't double mask with, a, with an N95 because it has really good filtration and uh, potentially really good fit. So uh, again, uh, well, just in conclusion again, let's keep Nebraska deaths below 3,000. I think we've got a really good chance of doing that now. Unfortunately, we did go past 2,000. So basic control, wear a mask, avoid crowds, keep your distance, and get vaccinated when your number is called. So hopefully this is helpful to you. Again, disclaimer, this is my opinion, not necessarily all the organizations I work with and for, but this gives you some background to where I am. And of course, healthylincoln.org is where all the past uh, videos are housed right now.